13.19 introduced a bunch of new changes as well as even a B patch that now has nerfed reroll and some other standard comps. So what's currently the best? Well, I've got all the answers and I dive into it in this edition of the tier list. Ionia Vanquishers is the only composition in the S tier that plays around four costs and isn't chasing around three stars currently. Main game plan is to really formulate around a lot of the glove and crit items that are leading towards AD. That usually means that you're trying to prioritize things like Last Whisper first so you can get the armor shredding as well as things like Quicksilver, Hand of Justice. You could even justify Guard Breaker on Zaya because just all these things help get that crit percentage really high. Remember that Vanquishers naturally give you that critical strike chance on your ability, kind of like Assassins from previous sets without jumping to the back. Therefore, you don't necessarily need to build things like Infinity Edge or Jewel Gauntlet or any of these people that have Vanquisher emblems because you already have the crit effect. You just really want to get more damage into the mix. In terms of the AD items, in my opinion, best in slot Neela is the Ionia emblem so you can get the attack speed and that mana buff as well as Giant Slayers that amplify damage and Quicksilver because she tends to get into the fray and picks up aggression from either a random Jarvan ult or other Mordekaisers or other things like that that can just lock onto Neela. Chances are you're going to go up against a lot of other Vanquisher players. And if you want to win the mirror edge of night could be really powerful because it gives your Neela the ability to drop aggro while focusing their target for example like another Neela, and then you'll be able to win that mirror if you're positioned correctly in terms of augments that you really want think about really powerful things that synergize with the trait like stolen vitality this augment got nerfed like five times since the start of pbe in fact this is wrong it got nerfed from 1.3 to 1 percent so it's, it's even worse than before but yet it's still averaging better than a 4.0 currently the reason why i put ancient archives too is because a lot of times you can actually utilize a lot of things like a vanquisher emblem and an ionia emblem in fact, I actually seen people take things like Tactician's Tool, which gives you two spatulas, and they don't actually make a Tactician's Crown. They actually make a Vanquisher Emblem with a glove, as well as an Ionia Emblem with a sword. And so what they end up doing is they actually end up getting for the ultimate package, which is six Ionia and six Vanquisher. If you're able to somehow get it, like a Vanquisher Emblem, for example, on Ari, then you just somehow play an Ash on eight. If you get six Ionia, six Vanquisher, this is, in my opinion, the best comp of the game that does not require three stars. And the crazy thing is, this is all level eight. You're able to even find a way to get to level nine and add legendary like Heimerdinger or Aatrox and that takes it over the top. There's not that many Ornn items that are particularly really strong but you can look about things like Sniper's Focus on Zaya for example or Death Defiance on Neela which is potentially really good as a defensive item for her. But in general right now and you'll probably see this throughout the entire video Ornn is not very popular right now so there's not many portable four situations that I'm very familiar with because it just seems like it's not very popular currently. The one thing I do want to say is don't forget about Shen items. You do really want to have a frontline tank. A lot of times people end up over prioritizing damage items and not having actual reliable tank and this ends up making you very vulnerable to high burst compositions like random sorcerers or uh, if a challenger player ends up getting through your front line just be very careful about over indexing on just offensive items only a legend that's really strong with this is poro because you have a really high chance of hitting things like stolen vitality and long distance pals and just really powerful augments but if you want to really hard force this specifically try earth and just force a tome and maybe get either the ionia or vanquishers and try to play around that I put long distance pals because it's pretty exceptional if you have Zaya and Neela feeding each other stats. In that case, make sure you go for things like Titans, for example, on Neela so you can get extra stats on Zaya in the middle of the fight. Build up is pretty straightforward. You just play around Ionia in the early game core alongside Vanquishers. So you get this set in Irelia, Jin, and Ash. This is a really common core four units that you end up playing. At level five, you end up playing like another Juggernaut, and ideally it's Warwick because you get Challenger that way as well. Challenger is not that important. Remember, Irelia is also the least important Ionia. So you can put a bunch of items on her. If you end up hitting things like, you know, Shen items like Bramble and Warmogs early, just put it on Irelia for now. And then in terms of the item holder, you can always put someone on Ash. At level six, maybe you end up playing something like this, a little bit awkward synergy wise. But if you have a plus one Ionio or plus one Vanquisher, this ends up cleaning up very nicely. So at level seven, you actually have a couple different boards that you can roll for. The first is if you have an Ionia emblem, you can just go for six Ionia and then get the Neela in ASAP with the Ionia emblem. And then instead of Warwick, you just play Shen. There you go. You have six Ionia plus one vanquisher this is a flex spot you can do whatever you want and there you go you're good to go if you don't have an ionia emblem that's where things get a little bit tricky but you instead of playing around six ionia you cut irelia you can even cut things like uh set and darius and then you play around sejuani instead plus one extra bruiser so let's, in this case let's play rexai because it's impractical to hit scion and in fact you can actually ride this type of board for a very long time and just at level eight instead of taking into ionia maybe you find the scion instead of the rex and then you can just play like another generic unit like 
you know, Jarvan, for example, is actually quite solid. This brings us into a second variation that is actually quite strong, which is just playing around the failure heart and healing orbs. This is like the board that I just built, but I'm trying to show you like different variations of different items you can play and different positioning. And so it really depends a lot on your setup, because if you don't have a last whisper, you might actually need something like failure. Because remember, it sunders and shreds for 30%. And so if you don't have last whisper, let's say you're slamming 80 items and you're getting no gloves whatsoever, right? You don't even have this guard breaker, for example, like, oh my God. I don't have gloves. I can't buy Lost Whisper. I don't even have the ability to make even shroud. That's totally fine. Just play Frail Yard and just ride this board for a long time. And at level eight, you can just tech in things like Cassante and nine, you can go Heimer. And this board can definitely win lobbies as well. This is the other variation that you could possibly play if you end up hitting, say, a Juggernaut emblem and not anything else. You can go six Juggernaut or just even four Juggernaut with Vanquishers if you're not hitting that Aatrox and put it on Neela. Neela ends up being a very good emblem user. And you'll probably see this throughout most of the set, but Neela can probably fit into most compositions and hold their emblem. And this includes things like the Ioni emblem we just showed you, but she can also fit in Challenger. She can also use Sharima. She can use Juggernaut. There's so many different things that Neela can do. She's very versatile and can use all different kinds of stats. In this situation, this is probably a composition that's not nearly as good. I move it down from S to A tier, but it's still very, very solid for a top three finish. Mordekaiser is the other premier four cost to play around currently that I think is borderline S tier. I'd probably put S slash A. And it's really centered around things like Noxus and Slayers. I'm going to show you two two variations that are really commonly played, but Mordekai is also quite flexible. You feel free you can play around with him whatever you want. The first is playing around a vertical Noxus. If you find a Noxus emblem, the most powerful holder of it early is Nefiri, because you can get it all in level five, which I'll show you later on. And then eventually you put it on Aatrox. Ends up going to nine and you play Katarina as well on top of all this. And if you can get nine Noxus, it's a legitimate win condition. Mordekai's best items actually are in the inverse of this order. It's Quicksilver because you want to get the attack speed. Plus Mordekai is a melee unit unless he goes into God of Death in which case he gets plus one range. Speaking of plus one range, RFC is also really good on him, but don't sleep on Nasher's Tooth because it gives him that ability to get the attack speed after he casts. So he ascends into the God of Death status and then he swings his mace really fast because of Nasher's Tooth. Really, really powerful stuff. Kind of a Chad. And so Mordekaiser is a really good unit to play around in particular. You want to prioritize having a lot of bows and things like this Nasher's Tooth. Now, a lot of people might be wondering about things like Samira reroll. You can actually reroll Samira into this, but in a lot of times what ends up happening is you end up just holding things like Samira too, and just hold on to every single Samira that you buy. And as you're rolling throughout stage six, seven, and eight, you just end up collecting Samiras and incidentally three-star Samira a lot of times. I can't tell you how many games that I've played Samira and I'm, I'm not even necessarily trying to roll for it, but I've had like five or six Samiras. I'm rolling down on seven. I find one or two more. A duplicator drops. Guess what? I just have Samira three. But that being said, you still do end up putting items on her a lot of times because she ends up being the second damage dealer source. They buff Darius, but do not put items on this guy or at least if you do don't expect him to do well katarina is more for rogues and less about the vertical noxus and cassiopeia can carry if you do end up for example you know hitting cassiopeia 3 basically just give her the samira items for the most part and just watch her go to town but weapons is most likely the best augment you could possibly get from Mordekaiser because gives him that range section as well as the attack speed which is just exactly what he wants Mordekaiser is kind of funny because he's kind of like olaf from previous sets you just don't really want him to be in melee range ever you want him to have range extension that way you have maximum uptime on his auto and you just have to spend time walking around. And that walking around during his ult duration is a really big deal. You read God of Death, the active only lasts for five seconds. So if you're spending around time walking around, you're going to lose a lot of that ability to do massive damage, which is why that range extension is huge. I'm going to show you the buildup of how to play around Mordekaiser, but I'm going to show you another variation that's starting to catch on to popularity, which is playing around Demacia and finding vertical Slayers with Quinn as the main anchor behind Mordekaiser. In this situation, if you get a plus one Slayer Crest, the best holder of it is Fiora and playing around Demacia. Hale, Quinn are the Demacians that also have Slayers as well as Mordekaiser. And if you can find Aatrox, it's really good. Then you can pretty much tech in whoever you want, whether it's Rek'Sai or you end up just going for a Kiana instead and getting a little bit of CC. Galia does not really matter you could actually just play sona for example and it's totally fine if you want some balance to frontline and backline and i do recognize that this is six slayer so chances are you're probably not going to be able to hit this this is more going to be like your level seven board that you're rolling for and then uh just playing around whatever you can at level eight don't forget that slayer is basically kind of like a hand of justice so you can have that effect for on fiora that replaces bloodthirster and go for something like titan itemization for mordekaiser is still relatively the same but if you don't have rfc you can go for giant slayer that's a very powerful item from 
for Mordekaiser in particular to get past tanks. And then Quinn's best item is Last Whisperer and Infinity Edge. If you can get her to three star, she will do massive damage. But it is very expensive and you end up rolling on seven instead of actually going for uh, anything else. In fact, let me change this chalkboard real quick so you can see you're going to be rolling on seven a lot to uh, hit things like that Quinn three and that Mordekaiser two. As we mentioned at the very beginning, rolling on seven is really important. You don't get to go to level eight very easily, at least at high elo, until you have a really strong board. So if you have like Mordekaiser one and Quinn two and Fiora one, chances are you probably have to roll at seven a lot more and upgrade a bunch of other stuff before you're able to go to eight. Also, don't forget things like Slayer's Resolve is pretty strong. It's almost like having a Titans on all of your units. Not really, but similar-ish. Six layers is very, very powerful. Give it a shot if you haven't already. There's other variations that you can play, especially if you have scope weapons around Mordekaiser in particular. Neela ends up being a very powerful user of scope weapons. So if you somehow find Neela, let's say you don't have like double Noxus emblem, you only have one. You could uh, just go ahead and play Neela with this and just give her some items like, you know, for example, Giant Slayer or Death Blade. And because she's a Vanquisher, she ties in with Darius and ends up being a very powerful variation that you can play as well. Positioning wise, just make sure that Mordekaiser and Samira and Cassio aren't just like going to get complete Jarvan ulted out of nowhere because this guy will ruin your day if he lands here and you don't have a QSS. Let's say you're just playing like you know, this, for example, and it's going to ruin your entire fight for the most part. So just try to spread out. You can have Cassio and Mordekaiser target the same thing because they're both AP champions. So if you have an Ionic Spark on Swain, you can have Swain on this side, Samira and the AD units on the other side. If you're looking for uh, Orn items, the best replacement for RFC is Sniper's Focus. That is by far Mordekaiser's best item, but also, I think I want to give a shout out to Zonia's as well. Zonia's giving him that vulnerability ends up making him a lot safer in that mid to late game fight, which could be really crucial for this. In terms of the buildup, you end up going to play around these core three units a lot. Samira, Cassiopeia, and Swain. And Nefiri ends up being the nice fourth unit here because of the Sharima tie-in with the challenger for the Cassiopeia. If you do have a Noxus emblem, put it on Nefiri because at level five, you'll be able to put in Darius or Katarina and you get five Noxus. And this ends up being a situation where you end up slow rolling a lot so if you end up chasing for Samira 3 and Cassiopeia 3 you're playing like you know golden ticket Noxus reroll this is where you end up going for this core five units if you have that Noxus emblem from here, you end up being able to just go to six and you pretty much just add whatever unit makes sense. So you can play Warwick, for example, as a juggernaut that's cheap and adds to your front line with Darius. Or you can even just add an Ash if you just need a little bit more utility because your front line is like really good. Let's say you two star Darius, two star Swain, two star Nefiri, and you need a little bit more backline support. You can just play this Ash. At seven, you end up just going for the full Noxus board. So in this case, you go for Mordekaiser. This is usually the way that you end up playing if you end up hitting things like this plus one Noxus, but chances are you won't so you're gonna play five noxes for a while and then you end up just teching in another frontliner that makes a lot of sense so in this case let's just play jarvin for example because it's a strategist and this is the way we kind of easily ladder ourselves into mordekaiser if you're playing the slayer variation you usually start with demacia and you end up playing around poppy kale and galio if you're lucky enough you can even find quinn and quinn ends up being pretty strong you cut this galio and you just play another bastion for example like alawi which is all really cheap and very efficient make sure you make Quinn the star so you can get that radiant death blade if you're able to get five Demacia on five, it ends up being very good. So you can go Galio and Sona in this instance, and then you're going to be in a really decent spot for the mid game because you get three rating nines, a lot of tempo. But let's say you don't, and then you end up having something like this, and you have to play around more pedestrian front line. You can just go ahead and play things like Poppy, Alawi, and maybe even a Kiana, just get a little bit of utility. She's kind of a mixture of support and damage. And level six, you can even go for things like Rek'Sai and get four Slayer and three Demacia, or you can just sub these two out for the Demacians again if you do end up getting it. And level seven, you can do Mordekaiser. You can have Rek'Sai or Kiana hold items for Mordekaiser. You can have like you know, Quicksilver, for example, and RFC on Kiana. That all moves to Mordekaiser the moment you end up finding it. And then you end up wanting to roll at seven. So you can have things like Fiora, give her things like that Slayer emblem if it ends up being in your arsenal. And then replacing Alawi for something like Galio or even that Jarvan if you end up being lucky enough and you can play a board kind of like this for a little bit of time. We move from the very bottom of S tier of one and a half compositions to now Challengers, which is is like kind of in the middle of a tier it's not even very strong or top of a tier challenges really depend on whether or not you're able to hit a lot of combat augments when i say a lot of combat augments i mean like the best ones and you get all three of them if you do it actually can perform very well and maybe even top two maybe even win a lobby depending on how hard you're ahead if you do end up hitting three powerful combat augments i listen to them out here like gifts of the fallen tons of stats know your enemy you do even have the potential to win the lobby straight up but it is very very high roll and it's depending on whether or not you're able to hit atrox and even get to level nine the cop is 
is also fairly expensive. So while I say that you're rolling really hard on seven after you're win streaking and slamming a bunch of these items, it ends up becoming kind of awkward because you might be too poor to get to level eight. And also, I will say that a couple of these units are really hard to land, such as Jarvan and Nasus at times because other people want them for different reasons. So you might end up hitting Kaisa Fiora, but you might have to improvise a little bit. Let's say instead of Nasus, you're playing like a Nautilus, for example. Instead of Jarvan, you probably play a Galio because you don't you need that for the Demacia. One thing I want to note is that as much as having three items on Kaisa and two items on Fiora, specifically these uh, combinations are some of the best you could possibly make with BT10s on Fiora and AP on Kaisa with mana generation. I will say that one item that's really important is Last Whisper on Quinn or even potentially even Shroud on Nasus. This is because challengers are high on auto attacks, meaning that they physically damage a lot of people just by a sheer amount of attacks that they do. And also there's one really important aspect of the challengers that's really key, which is when their target dies, challengers dash to a new target and then increase their attack speed bonus. So when something dies, challengers end up getting this massive attack speed bonus that ends up helping them get their resets, which will snowball the fight. And so that's why the last whisper is really important. Get past those super tanks and be able to shred. So that way you can get those resets and dash to your next target. So that's why the positioning is usually around Quinn behind Fiora. So you can even have like Quinn, for example, one over just directly attacking whoever Fiora is actually trying to go through. The other aspect is having Aatrox and Nefiri always next to Fiora. If you don't have Aatrox, Nefiri goes next to Fiora. But once you do, you really want the dark weapon to fall onto Fiora. And then you surround her a little bit because of Demacia. So you get a little bit extra resistances on Nasus. You don't have to position this way. Sometimes you end up having Nasus on the left side. Let's go ahead and expand the board, for example. Let's say that you're going up against like Cho'Gath and Cassiopeia. You have Nasus tanking the Cassiopeia here. But let's say you have Fiora on the Cho'Gath. You really want Quinn to shred this Cho'Gath and get through it. But you really want this Nasus to withstand the tanking from Cassiopeia. This is an instance where you end up separating your front line. In terms of Orn items, the best one that you can find is Death Defiance on Fiora if you get it with Titans. Death Defiance defers that damage over the next four seconds, and that ends up stacking Titans because it's instances of taking damage. It's a really funny interaction. If you combine Death Defiance and Titans, it ends up being very, very powerful. And something to think about if you end up opening up a Portable Forge or an Orn Anvil of some kind. If you do end up getting a plus one challenger, it, the best user of it is Aatrox. And if you're able to somehow get like another one, you go for Town Dremblom and Heimerdinger. The thing about plus one challengers is that it's actually kind of awkward to fit in this comp. The best holder of it is Aatrox or a Heimerdinger or maybe even the Belveth. But like you're not really trying to go for it because it's pretty airtight in terms of what you can fit on your board. You sometimes do play six challengers if you need to rent that on level seven. But as you get to level eight, it's something that you end up dropping because it's not that important and you have to play low quality units like Irelia and Samira in order to get there. You end up wanting to drop them. But we'll talk about them in a sec here because they're important for the buildup. The buildup is pretty straightforward when it comes to challengers. A lot of times you want to open up four so you have maximum tempo. Samira is such a versatile item holder. She might be one of my favorite one costs of all time because of just how flexible it is. You can hold things like Shojin and for example like BT Titans and like that's totally fine. She's basically going to be the mule holding for Kaisa and Fiora. The exception is you don't really want AP on her so if you do end up finding AP you put it on someone like I really for example like death cap or if you find Morello Morello is potentially pretty good if you want to put that later onto a Kaisa you know you can put things like giant slayer and death play although these are not items you end up slamming it's just really really versatile on Samira in general the level five you end up playing sets a lot of time or any kind of juggernaut that really makes sense but set makes it pretty easy and then this gives you some flexibility for example where let's say uh you don't even have things like you know Warwick and Fury you could just play around like a Jin core for example and kind of play that Ionia for a little bit of time just have Samira and I really hold these items but if you're going to play around things like this the four challenger you end up playing around sets don't worry about the Ionia bonus too much at level six you have a lot of options you can actually play that Ionia we talked about so for example you can just peck in Jin if you really like you can actually do some other really interesting things like Jinx for example on six with Zahn if you have like robotic arm it ends up being also a really good item holder if you have like Shojin and Giant Slayer you could just do like challenger on Jinx. Like this would be really, really powerful as well. And then on seven, you're pretty much just selling everything not named Warwick and Nefiri and just rolling it down. You want to hold onto Kaisa and Fiora, of course. And you also want to hold on to things like Jarvan and Quinn so you can get the Masia in. And then this is like the six units that you play plus another Juggernaut of some kind. So a lot of times you go for Nasus, but this is the most expensive variation you can play on seven. In reality, what ends up happening is you don't find Nasus. You play another Juggernaut like Nautilus. And you don't find Jarvan. So you end up playing someone like Galio. And then you play a, a board kind of like this on seven for a while because it's just impractical to expect that you're able to roll for Kaisa, Fiora, Nasus, and Jarvan and hit all of them. Then at 80, if you're able to find like Aatrox, the whole comp kind of comes together. And then you slowly replace these two units. Yeah, 
Galio Nautilus with Nasus and J4. And then you position correctly instead of the donkey way that I was positioning for and fall out. There you go. Another unit that's in the middle of the pack and it kind of depends on how your opener is, is Azir. Azir is really flexible because the only two units you really care about at the end of the day are Nasus and Azir. A lot of people actually call it an Azir composition, but in reality, you can actually get away with one star Azir as long as you have a two star Nasus. If it's inverted one star Nasus, two star Azir, chances are you actually lose a lot of fights because it depends on how long your Nasus can stall by having things like the Shrima ascend Nasus and make him a lot tankier and make him much more durable. The thing is, there's a lot of different ways that you can play Azir, and I only included three packages, but in reality, there's like five or six that you can play. These are some of the most common that you'll end up seeing. And the most reliable ones, in my opinion. The first package is something that we talked about already, which is a strategist and Soko approach, where you have Soko be the sorcerer that times with Swain. You get the Zon mod, you play around things like the Viral and Plague, which is like by far his best Zon mod that you put onto Silco. And then you go for things like Blue Buff and the Gunblade onto Silco, as well as Morello, burn the front line, and then have Azir, Silco, and Nasus be a, a triple threat. This is like the most common variation that you might see being played. The problem with this comp is that you need to kind of hit two star everything. The only unit that you don't really need two star of is Azir, but even then you kind of want two star Azir. But if you have like Nasus 2, Silco 1, Azir 1, like I talked about how you could win fights, but chances are you're not going to win a lot of them. If you have Nasus 1, Silco 1, and Azir 2, you're just going to lose everything. If you have Silco 2, Azir 1, Nasus 1, you're going to lose everything. So it just feels like kind of hard to actually stabilize the mid game reliably. So a lot of times you end up playing around like Misfortune instead for quite some time and then replace Misfortune with Silco and then tech more things like Strategist and Jarvan back in because this is like the ultimate comp that you usually want to play with. The other package is, is actually a vertical Shurima and this usually ends up being things like Shurima's Legacy which ends up being quite solid right now. Shurima's Legacy is actually still bugged right now so just be careful sometimes it can aim at your own team but still a very powerful augment in the data. I haven't picked it yet but I actually have heard that vertical Shurima is still very solid so you just basically instead of playing around the Juggernauts and the Soko variation you basically just play like all the Shurimas possible and then you just go Jarvan onto this on top of it. The last variation that you could possibly play is around a flex Ionia package. If you somehow spike an Ari, which does happen from time to time, you could play like Ari, Karma, Shen, Soraka, and Tarek. And this is like a really interesting package you could play around Azir and Nasus. And you need to just throw in any Juggernaut you possibly can. So let's just play like, you know, the Nautilus from here. And all of a sudden, now you have the Juggernaut that ties into Nasus. You have the Strategist and the stuff like this. It's kind of a jarbled mess. I kind of recognize it. Now that I'm doing this, I'm like, huh, there's like 20 champions on this. How do you actually decipher it? Let me clean it up a little bit, just a tad. There we go. That looks a lot cleaner. So this is like an opportunity for you to play this kind of board if you end up rolling and hit something like an Ari and you have the Juggernaut for Nasus. You got Tarek. You probably want to put him in the middle next to Nasus. Keep Nasus next to the Azir. Shiv or Spark. You don't really need both as long as you have one or the other. And this is like a pretty another stable way that you can play. In general, right now, just as a small tip, is that if you just have like Soraka and Tarek, you can kind of flex a Shen, Tarek, Soraka core in almost anything and just play around it for the most part. Like this totally could just be your level seven for Azir. You could even use this as a launching pad to go back into Juggernauts. Let's say you find the Aatrox and you know you find a two-star set, you can just replace Shen, Tarek. And then Soraka comes out, you can just go back and play Misfortune, for example, and voila, you're back in the strategy. So there's a lot of interchangeableness of how you end up playing Azir. Uh, I know I just like threw a lot at you in the past couple minutes, but uh, the most important thing is focus on what makes Azir really strong, which is a good front line and making sure to stall for Azir as long as you can, because he's going to whittle things down little by little and having a really strong Nasus. Some really good augments for him are Magic Wand, Healing Orbs, like Magic Wand for the AP, Healing Orbs to sustain things like the Juggernaut front line or things like that Shen and Ionia or Shurima if you want. The one thing I will say is that if you end up playing Vertical Shurima, try to go for scaling on him meaning that the longer the fight goes the stronger he gets so archangels and rage blade are really good because you want to give him the ability to out sustain and outlast everyone if you go for that vertical shurima so if you go for four six or nine try to get all that ramping stuff on his ear one thing to know is that if you do end up playing misfortune or if you end up going back into silco and playing around say the swain instead and going for this kind of build try to make sure that silco and mf are kind of in the center so that way they can like shoot their abilities towards the center and get mass aoe and this is because silco and mf are going to be targeting things like the closest units and that ends up being a really important aoe that you need to target because if you have them on the corner mf might miss a little bit if you have silco in the corner 
you might end up throwing it at the wrong target. Overall, though, Azir is kind of mid. You know, again, I put him in like in the mid slash lower part of tier A right now. So uh, just be very careful with how you end up committing to him because if you end up being contested, it can really support almost two players for a top four. It's very rare that both of you will, though. In terms of Orn item, I will say that there is one condition that makes Azir particularly powerful, which is a Zonia. So you find like a Zonia's Paradox. It's one of the best items that Azir could possibly have, if not the best. And so if you start off with it early in the game, you can definitely say this is an Azir game and try to find your way to him somehow. somehow. The buildup of Azir is oriented around Cassiopeia. A lot of times you're going to be playing around things like Cassiopeia and Renekton and using that as a Shreema core. You also could go ahead and play around Swain and Samira and just play around that Noxus as well. Cassian ends up being really powerful. You put things like, you know, Gunblade, Nashor's Tooth and other AP on items on her. She's very, very strong. In fact, I'm willing to say that Cassie is just the best one cost in the game, period. Even just not across a specific damage type. She's just really, really, really powerful right now. At level five, you probably just end up like adding a little bit more front lines. So my favorite unit in this kind of spot is like Taric, or instead of a Sorcerer, you can just add another Bruiser. So let's just add Vive. But this ends up allowing you to, at level six, play like, you know, Soraka for more front line. And hey, let's say you end up hitting things like Taric, for example. And there you go. You have Sorcerer and you have the Targon going. And at level seven, let's just keep it really simple, for example. So let's say you just hit Shen and that's it. You just can't really find much. You roll down to like 20 gold. You're really not finding anything. If you just two star this board, you'd be surprised at how well it can actually do already. But we're not satisfied at just that, right? So we find, you know, Nefiri instead of Renekton. You can get that Challenger in. You start to see that the synergy bar is actually starting to look kind of pretty. You finally find Nazir. Hooray! Cut this Noxus nonsense that you don't really need and you can go for Misfortune instead and voila now you have another level seven boy that's playing around strategist you found a jarvin finally cool well we can take out things like that shen for example that's just kind of there for the bastion invoker which is not that big of a deal you find that nasus finally goes in over fury and you can just play this get to level eight and then slowly but surely tech things out find more juggernauts let's just go ahead and play nautilus and then we find silco warwick and we're back into the default build that we usually see where you can play around juggernauts or you play around silco instead and if you play around Shreema, it's actually pretty straightforward. You just keep adding more and more Shreema units. Aphelios is kind of in a weird spot in the meta for four costs, as well as Silco. A lot of times you end up playing Silco in something like Sorcerers, and you play Aphelios and more like Piltover Gunners, but you can actually combine both of them under Targon Flex. Targon Flex is actually really fascinating because as much as this section is really about talking about some of these other four costs that aren't Neela, Zaya, and Fiora, Kaisa, Azir, etc. These are actually not the stars of the comp. It's really about Nico. Nico is a new three cost that plays around Ishtil. So depending on the Ishtil, it could be really, really powerful. Instead of, say, have this Aphelios and Silco, you end up playing around Milio instead and then tag on Invoker, ideally Rise, and that varies from portal to portal. The thing about Nico is that she actually is quite flexible with the items. You can try to go for two separate builds. One that is a lot more bruiser attack focused, which is like giving her combat things like Titan's Resolve, Spark, and Crown Guard. Or you can itemize her more defensive like a tank, giving her things like Bramble Vest, War Mogs, and just make her as a traditional Bastion frontliner that can actually output some DPS. That being said, I think you want to really lean more into things like Crown Guard, Titan's Resolve, and Spark. Very, very common setup. If you don't have Spark, let's say instead you have Shiv on like Soraka, for example, you can go ahead and play Gunblade on Nico. Gunblade on Nico is her best three star item, but the problem is two star Nico with Gunblade is kind of underwhelming. This is because at three star, her damage becomes so outrageous that Gunblade can start healing herself, and it's really good with the Bastion frontline since you have a lot of resistances that the Gunblade can continue to heal. But back towards the Aphelios line, you don't really even play Jinx in this. I actually just included this. A lot of times you end up playing for like a core set of four Bastion and four Invokers, but if you do end up hitting like Nico items and you get a bunch of 80 items, I think this is the best way to play Aphelios and Tekken Silco as well, because while they're really important for DPS, they're not the stars of the composition nearly as much as Nico and the Targon is. I would say that the best items for Silco are Blue Buff, Gunblade, and Morello, but if you don't have, you know, another Gunblade uh, to keep that Nico alive, you can just put up straight up AP, for example, and just put the Archangel so you can add scaling AP. One other thing to be careful about is not going overly prioritization on 
on Aphelios items that people go out of their way to make like Rage Blade and Death Blade and Giant Slayer, Runin's Last Whisper. In this composition, Aphelios again is support as a secondary or even a tertiary carry. Just give him whatever items you can. Most likely you're tagging off a carousel or let's say you open up like an extra item anvil, realize I can make one really good item and like a Runin's. This is the kind of version that you can actually tech into because a lot of times you don't want to be stuck with like a weird suboptimal item in your last four components. You can actually just tech in Aphelios and just give him random items. Now I put in Jinx because the Zon mod is really good. I talked about it before, but the best mod for Soko is Violent Bioware. But if you don't have that, then feel free to just take out Jinx and just play like whatever you can afford to squeeze in. Sometimes people play like, you know, Jace, for example, and Jace can be in this support attack speed for Soraka and Aphelios. And then if you hit Gangplank, obviously Gangplank is part of that top end, which is really, really good. Positioning wise, just keep your front row kind of stacked together so that things like Redemption and Terra can be really good. Backline is supposed to be spread out as usual. Another variation that we can play is to try to go for Soraka 3. Soraka really wants mana generation items. So that's usually through Shojin or Adaptive Helm. I like Adaptive Helm a little bit better right now, giving her a lot of AP. I like Archangels a lot for scaling AP, but you could totally just put Death Cap on her. And then a little bit of extra damage. Sometimes you put like Jewel Gauntlet, for example, to crit, or maybe even just a Gunblade for extra healing. If you do end up going for this, you usually slow roll at six. The Oz or Nico are actually still pretty good at six, despite it being one level below what you usually roll for. Because if you're rolling for a two and three cost, level six is pretty close to optimal since you're not spending extra gold. And it's not like going to six is going to meaningfully improve some of your synergies. Like if you go level six and you play around this, for example, for your slow roll, yes, you don't have four invokers, but remember that every three seconds, you're just giving extra mana to your invokers and nobody else. Not to mention, you might not even have Shen. You might just be playing like Poppy, for example. So if you slow roll on six, it's a board that's going to look a lot of times kind of similar to what we have right here. And then you go to seven, you eventually find Shen. Then you eventually can tech in something like Silco if you want for the Sorcerer, or you can just add another Invoker. A lot of times, like we talked about, Rise is really good. In terms of like, what's the best Rise to play around? It's actually more that there's only a few Rises that you don't want to play around. The first is probably like Zon Rise. Zon Rise is actually a carry Rise variant where the more gold you have, the more portals and damage you end up doing. And you also provide Shred. But a lot of times, by the time you hit Rise, you already should have Shred, like a spark and a shiv so you don't really need that shred and then unless you have like overflowing amounts of gold it's kind of hard to get rise to carry in that spot so i think zon rise is probably the weakest and then the other two that are a little bit on the sketch side is shirima and bilge water but they're still playable and the reason why is because that's a economy focused rise you're trying to actually farm resources and sometimes you just need actual straight up power and so shirima rise and bilge water rise a little bit more situational outside of that though you can pretty much try all the other rises and he ends up being very very, very strong for this comp if you choose to play for the invoker one thing i do want to notice if you do end up playing the aphelios and silco variants is that silco is the item prio as well the delta on having items on him versus not is extreme this is all to say that if you're not rolling for three star soraka that silco is the one that's going to be primary getting the items and so without three items on silco you won't succeed this is all to say that if you have zero items on aphelios you end up not having your average placement change very much in the data if you have zero items on silco in this setup you go from what could be a top four to maybe a fifth or sixth. That's how big of a difference it is in terms of placement change. In terms of the Orn items, the four people I've discovered that Mana Zane is insane on Silco. So if you can, it just gives you a lot of upfront burst. You do have to keep in mind that with Mana Zane Silco, that usually is supposed to be for a high burst sorcerer setup. It's a little bit less good when you're trying to out sustain opponents like this. That being said, it's still pretty solid. So give it a shot. In terms of Nico items, I personally like Anima Visage a lot. Although you could also justify some really interesting combinations like Zonia's, for example, on Nico, because then she becomes really difficult to deal with in the late game and it's kind of like having the ice Ishtil for her, which is pretty good. Speaking of Ishtils, I do think that if you were playing Milio, that the best for Nico would be either wood or ice. But I've been told that you can make all kinds of Ishtils work. So experiment with what you want. For example, someone said that fire could be really good if you have a lot of AP sources. So you put fire hex with Soraka, for example, give her a bunch of AP sources with things like this Archangels and watch her go to town. In terms of the build up, a lot of times you end up just wanting to play around an early Nico orb if you possibly can and just go around the invokers and bastions in this case i'd actually just have cassio hold on to things like blue buff and gunblade super duper strong and again cassio is the best one cost in the game currently if you don't have nico don't worry and you just want to play around like two star bastions you can totally play like alawi poppy million cassiopeia and this is a really cheap board that honestly if you upgrade everything could even five streak especially if you get to level five and you're able to add in that nico finally that can be really really powerful at six ideally you add the Tarek, and your board is a 
pretty much already done. He starts slow rolling and you just sub out this Cassio for Soraka. And then this is kind of where you decide based off your augments that you want to hit. If you're hitting things like Morning Light, Tarkon Heart, Healing Orbs, really, really powerful healing sources and shielding sources. You end up trying to tech in either additional Targons and go for that Aphelios and Silco, or you just stay on Invokers. You might be wondering, by the way, if you hit Shen, you hit a plus one Invoker emblem somehow and you get like Invoker on Taric. Are you supposed to go for six or eight Invokers? And the answer right now is no, because units like Karma are not very reliable damage sources currently in this composition. And while you do want to play around Rise and units like this, you don't really want to be playing too many weak units because then you're going to be stuck with like Passio, Karma, Rise, and it's kind of awkward to fit it all. And then your front line starts dropping off because you have to replace you know certain units. And your Invoker setup looks kind of something like this and then ends up being quite poor. So I would not recommend going for vertical Invokers. I mean, if they buff Invokers in the future, maybe you could go for it. But right now, I would highly advise against it. The other variation of Aphelios that's really popular is not even really about Aphelios, but it's about Piltover for the most part. The raw power of the Piltover cash out that links to the Gunners is really, really strong. So in general, you're looking for things like, you know, plus one Piltover Heart, or you're looking for dueling Gunners. Ends up being quite, quite strong in this composition because you end up getting a bunch of attack speed and a lot of power. And this is the way you go over the top. Main flow of the game is that you're trying to lose every single round until around stage three, five. Around three, five, you level to seven. Hopefully, you've backed up a bunch of gold and you can get to level seven roll down for a board kind of like this but just probably without gangplank but you can roll for something like this and without scion you just roll for a rexi and if you two star this entire board on seven you will cash out it is very very hard for anyone to keep up with you at that point so you're just trying to amass a bunch of resources build a bunch of 80 items it doesn't really matter if you have things like even rage blade for example or even even trout you can go for like last whisper and totally just play something like this and just make you know, generic defensive items for Sejuani. As long as you get something like this, you will cash out, you will get a big payout, and most likely you'll be able to make a big come from behind victory. I will say that one thing is that some people always overclump Jace with the Gunners because his acceleration blast affects one unit to left and right for attack speed. So people feel like they want to go full greed. Sometimes that makes you really vulnerable to Jarvan. So if you do something like this, where you stack like a bunch of units on the left, Jarvan is going to be most likely landing like right around here instead and not actually attacking your Aphelios and Jace. And that's really, really important if you have items like Rage Blade, which you need to get the attack speed stacks. Other than that, though, pretty straightforward for a Piltover cash out. You've seen probably dozens of highlights on YouTube by now, but for the most part, all you got to do early game is just try to lose streak as best you can. And I, I've talked about it before with Piltover, but the most important thing is that you sometimes guarantee that you lose. If you're playing something like Orianna with Jason Vi, try to trap units in here so that way Vi can't escape the middle. And it's important that you put the TX in the front. So that way you avoid the units end up walking up and potentially fighting 3v3. If you need more information about Piltover, check out any of the other videos that we've done before covering over the rerolled Piltover or any other Piltover strategies or your favorite YouTuber streamer that's constantly complaining about Piltover and yet uploading highs of them on a daily basis. Let's get into what I think are the best reroll compositions as well. At S tier is the boss slash Ash reroll. I actually just did another video on this with Juan Mei, who did this in a tournament before it actually got buffed in the current patch. I didn't realize it was actually going to be that strong, even borderline the best comp in the game if you're able to hit everything. It's just really funny that I did that video and now here we are where it is easily the best reroll composition in the game right now. When you play the boss, you used to end up hitting a bunch of sets and try to play damage items like Jewel Gauntlet, Hodge, Night Harvester, things like that. But now because you have so much Vanquisher damage, it's actually better to build him tanky things like Bramble, Redemption, Declaw, Stoneplate, and then just have a bunch of the Vanquishers deal damage while him solo frontlining. This is a really viable way that you can get it off. Ash also is a really good reroll. You don't even need the boss. This is like a way you can play it even without the boss augment. Get that enemy emblem on Ash. Get that GS. If you have someone holding Last Whisper already, like a Jin or a Zaya, for example, just go for like a Death Blade and just watch her deal all that damage. This is the early game board for the most part. At level four, you just add in whatever Juggernaut you can, like Warwick. At level five, you end up playing kind of this Darius because you're going to start bridging your way back into Juggernauts and Vanquishers. And you actually have a couple of options here at six where you can tech in another Juggernaut for example and if you're playing like the boss or set with stone play you just kind of position like this you can play four juggernaut three unit vanquishers you hit a random sejuani feel free to just play that and drop this warwick as well and sometimes when you're rolling at six you just find like that random like one or two zayas or neelas it's like a really powerful way you can just play like a level six board and it's totally fine 
If you do end up finding six Ionia, you could also end up committing to that as well and just playing something like this at level six and just slow rolling on six until you hit three star set and ash because at your maximum chance of hitting two cost three stars with 40 percent don't forget about things like reroll augments i'm highlighting a bunch of them throughout the course of the video frequent flyer is one of the strongest and best ways for you to get cheap rerolls throughout the rest of the game you can hit ash and set three very quickly demon flare swain is also s tier currently if you're able to somehow hit swain three because you're not contested either noxus or sorcerers it ends up being one of the strongest win conditions that you can possibly have around this composition demon flare with bloodthirster titans redemption in particular is absurdly good you don't need to go for things like archangels or more ap damage and giant slayer and jewel gauntlet and, and spark you can actually just get it done purely off of swain and the immense amount of stats that you get either through noxus or sorcerers now you might be wondering like why i put the board this way is because you can actually choose the data says that noxus is a little bit stronger but it's hard to pull off because you need things like scion and for six orc while you know i did put ari here you could totally get away with just playing like oriana and just playing six orcs this way and it's a pretty standard board so if you're playing sorcerers for example it's just swain demon flare and then you just put like Tarek here Soko and Orion in the back and you have six orc plus you know maybe a Cassadin for example or a Shen so you just get more you know Bastion frontline with some invoker stuff and then the other alternative is just to play around Noxus and kind of do the same thing which is what we talked about with other builds you just play seven Noxus you can tech in something else completely like Jarvan for example for that strategy if you want as well and voila you have a Demon Flare Swain that's also going to completely clear and the early games are pretty straightforward either way I'm pretty sure no matter what you actually want to start Noxus at the very beginning of the game for Swain you end up having something like this and then you tech in another sorcerer of some kind whether it's you know Tarek for additional frontline or Malzahar for additional support DPS no matter what you have you want to have Swain two star with a bunch of items and play around both the Noxus and sorcerers and based on what you're getting with the crest based on the way you're getting offered off your augments you can totally just make justifications to go into a one vertical versus the other let's say for example you're you're at three two augment you're like oh I got overcharged mana font oh yeah totally let's just go ahead and play sorcerers or instead you get things like total domination and you have an opportunity to just get a bunch of noxus on the line go for that as well i do want to reiterate one final thing swain three is really hard to find there's a lot of people that really want this swain for strategist board for sword comps for noxus comps and so the biggest nerf to this composition that they could out possibly do is just make swain as versatile as he is and so uh just be advised that it's going to be difficult to hit this sometimes even though you have it lo and behold Cho'Gath is still alive and feast in this guy with six bruiser is still very hard to stop especially if you get rolling early with the plus one bruiser golden ticket or things like pandora's bench to be able to get things snowballing i did a video that covers a lot of things like chogath rerolls so check it out a little bit more in depth it's about the same as before for the most part you have a lot of options in terms of how you actually choose to play your back line the front line makes sense chogath always wants bramble dragon claw and redemption that's pretty much almost non-negotiable in terms of like what you really want to replace with it instead of redemption you can play like anima visage for example with orn items but for the most part you're always going to end up trying to play around these core items if you do end up wanting to play around like another set of one cost rerolls to go alongside Cho'Gath try Cassiopeia and Renekton I think it's way more consistent you've heard me talk about early in the video Cassiopeia is the best one cost to play around currently in the game if you do end up wanting to play around Malzahar and Void I totally get it but I think Malzahar is way worse if you really think about it Malzahar only gives you a void remora as well which is you know just extra stats and stall which is like not even that important because you have six bruiser you have so much stall anyways yeah just play around cassie will be if you can your build up is going to be pretty similar to what we usually talk about which is like kind of like this core four then you slowly add more bruisers over time well not so drawn you end up adding rexi instead let's say you're in a situation where you hit cho three but you have cassio two and like a pair of renekton and you're just like wow i just really don't want to roll for like just three star cassio and three star renekton from here because i just already have choke at three you can totally just replace like Cassio and let's just make this like a two-star Renekton you eventually find your other bruisers but your backline could just be like you know Kaisa and Fiora for example because you know you have that void that you really you know love and then all of a sudden you have Kaisa with a bunch of challenger items like you know like usual and then you have Fiora with like Titans and Bloodthirster and now this is another reliable way you can get some DPS in. another way you can also play it is around Azir and Jarvan so you have like Strategist and Shurima that links to the Renekton then you go for the other things that we talked about like maybe the Nash's Tooth and that Guard Breaker 
Breaker that can potentially be also really strong. And so this is sort of tie in some of the other parts of the video that we talked about, which is like, these are flexible carries that can go around Cho'Gath because Cho'Gath is just your frontline. It's all about what you do with your backline carry. If you want more information, check out the other Cho video, which I talked about, still extremely relevant. They nerfed him a little bit, but pretty much the exact same way and still very good at the very bottom of S tier. If you do want a legend recommendation, this is probably not Poro. This is probably Lee Sin. Get Trade Sector. Try to force Jogath every time into Gold Augment on 2-1. Rogues are still potentially really good. And now they've pretty much settled on rerolling around Graves. Then slowly but surely adding in things like Katarina, Kiana, and Echo 3 over time while rolling for Jinx. These five units are the core. And then you pretty much add in whatever you want based on the situation. So if it's a good Ishto portal, like Wood, for example, Wood on Graves is good. You just patent that Nico. If you end up playing around like a lot of Kiana, let's say you hit Graves 3, Kiana 3, and you hit like early Mordekaiser and Scion, that's really good for the Noxus to support Katarina, and you get Slayer for Kiana as well. Really good augments for this are things like Idealism, anything that gives you like a bunch of Lifesteal or Omnivamp rather, so that way you can sustain the fight. Rogues recently changed so that when they fall below 35 instead of 50% health, now they become untargetable and dash the back line. Some people believe this is actually a buff, but I think that's case by case. Sometimes it can be a buff and sometimes it's like, okay, well that actually trolled my entire fight. Definitely experiment with a little bit of rogue positioning and see if that ends up being a nerf or a buff to you. If you want more information about this reroll comp, you can check out this video that I covered a bunch of different variations and I'll also probably talk about one other variation later on in this video. I think rogues are currently in the middle of A tier at the moment. I think you really want to play around Graves right now. I think the tempo is too high to reliably plan around Echo, Katarina, and Kiana. And so a lot of times people make the decision to go into rogues based off of having like a Graves too early with a good items and then having like a Wood Ishtal. This ends up being very powerful, particularly on Graves. And so we want to really plan around that one cost reroll. And the benefit is other people are playing things like Kale or Cho'Gath or other one cost ends up being very solid for you. I'll say overall though that rogues are inconsistent and they don't really win many lobbies they actually like get top four a lot so if you are playing rogues just don't expect to win but expect lots of messages in all chat kale is back and kale's really really strong if you're able to get the double rage play specifically onto her with three star kale and maybe even some other three star units like three star poppy three star galio the thing about demacia kale is that you actually have a lot of options in terms of itemizations you can go for things like galio three with like bramble for example you don't really itemize Poppy very often, but I like throwing like a Sunfire in her early game so you can get really stable amount of damage. And then you end up having things like the Slayer Crest, which is really good if you end up playing on Fiora so you can get four Slayer and seven Demacia. One thing about positioning is that Kale ends up wanting to be sometimes isolated away so that way it's like away from other enemy Jarvins. If you position, for example, like this, let's say Fiora is holding the Demacian item, so is Jarvan and Kale. You kind of get like everything here, but Kale is completely safe from a lot of the targets. If you don't get double rage, Play. sometimes you can go for like RSC on Kale instead ends up being quite solid but in general you are always trying to prioritize Kale items first so you go for like double rage blade and if you get extra bows you can become titans for example here or uh even a giant slayer somewhere else maybe you throw some items on Mordekaiser you don't even mind having a lot of bows in this composition one thing important to note, you don't need Shred. Kale at level 6 gains the ability to shred enemies for 3 seconds with every third attack. This is a special passive based on levels for Kale. So that in mind you don't need spark you don't need show but if you do want something like you know quinn damage let's say you go for a quinn three somehow you do want that last whisper on her so she can deal that damage and it shreds for fiora as well early game is pretty straightforward for kale uh you do end up wanting to just kind of do the whole like kale kale poppy dynamic and then either selling a lot to make gold interest or just trying to lose streaks so you can get a bunch of gold and hyper roll at three one from there you slow roll and then you get three star kale you don't have to go for three star poppy but but you sometimes often do because you're just collecting a bunch of one cost and you just add in more Demacy. And so a lot of times you're here with like level three and Lowy, and then you're going up against Krugs with like this level four board. And then you slowly just add in more things over time. You go for Sona, cut this, you find that Quinn, which is particularly really powerful. And then you can start separating a little bit more because you're now playing stage three. And at level six, you can just add in like, you know, Kiana, for example, for Slayer, it does not really matter. Usually you only level the six after you hit KO3. And then at seven, maybe you just add in this Rek'Sai until you find Mordekaiser. And then you eventually find Fiora and Jarvan. You get the seven Demacia. And there you go. I will say that there's one thing to note is that if you do end up fight facing a lot of rogues in the lobby, things like Edge of Night and Zonia's are particularly really powerful. Not both, just choose, choose one or the other. But sometimes you go like double Rage Blade, Edge of Night, and then you just put your Demacia 
collection items on other people try to avoid the other rogue players last of the top reroll compositions in my book is twisted fate multicasters this is dark tech that I feel like almost no one is playing at high elo. And I'm the only person as far as I seen in challenger even trying this right now. And I've had success with it. I think that multicaster twisted fate is really powerful, but it's dependent on one thing, which is hitting the perfect items for twisted fate. In fact, you can even justify taking twisted fate, the legend for Pandora's items. You can get things like spark bramble on swaying with healing, like a redemption. And then specifically like these three items, like blue buff, gunblade and JG. If I were to be picky, I don't think gg is necessary you can instead for example play for a death cap if you just read a little bit more flat stats for example you could just get actual power that's where things like perfected repetition and magic wand can come into play because you just get more scaling ap which is really powerful if the fights continue this cup actually has two variations you can play demacia with galio jarvan or you can actually play around narlis and mf it's very sketch though with frontline if you end up playing something like this so I personally like the Demacian version a lot more because it just gives you more consistency to how your frontline operates. That being said, if you do end up playing this variation, it ends up being really important that you try to hit things like Swain 3 and potentially Galio 3, because as you're slow rolling on 6, you need a bunch of 2 costs. If you're rolling on 6, you're actually going to be cutting 2 multicasters and not playing around 3. And a lot of times doing something like this, like 3 strategists with Twisted Fate Sona, if you don't have Jarvan, you can just play like Poppy, for example, and play like temporary frontline. But on 6, you want to slow roll a lot and try to get your Twisted Fate 3, your Galio 3, your Swain 3. You could end up chasing for Talia 3 as well, but it's less important and I've had more success not trying to prioritize that unless I hit something crazy like Golden Ticket and I could reroll it. This composition has a ton of power. It's not really well developed and the best part is you're really uncontested. No one's buying this Twisted Fate unit, like not even a little bit. Uh, the only time they ever buy him is for Vertical Village Water and no one's playing that. So definitely give it a try if you haven't already. I personally think this has the potential to shoot up to S tier, but right now it's kind of in the middle of A tier. I'm biased though because I found success with it on ladder so just putting it out there that if it's not working for you it's uh it might be a player differential and finally our bonus content for this video is talking about the best double trouble comps that are currently not being talked about but are very strong and it's hard to see it on the stats first is the most obvious one we've talked about before double trouble rogue you just basically play two of each rogue two graves two kiana two cats two echoes if you're able to somehow get more than that then maybe just add in that jinx let's say you find like a rogue emblem you could just go ahead and, and find a way to tech that in but for the most part you just play two rogues of each kind it's pretty straightforward very very strong the second thing that's much spicier and kind of uh something that comes from china which is soraka and nico double trouble which is playing around soraka and Terex and nico's basically healing and shielding each other the entirety of the fight it's actually quite strong and if you're able to get things like adaptive and archangels on soraka it basically can heal nico and sustain her infinite and nico's items are really flexible you don't need gunblade and spark for example you can totally just do like you know, titans for example and war mogs which are just other different tanky units that you can put onto nico and it's perfectly fine and good and don't forget that things like redemption are ultimately really good on Tarek, and then you know you can ultimately play for things like bramble and shen you would actually think that this comp isn't like good enough to actually win but i have seen it win lobbies especially if you somehow get to eight and just like play something like this or even just find like a really powerful rise and double up on rise for example it's actually really really strong so give it a try and let me know what you think and last but not least this is uh, another really powerful double trouble which is samira double trouble this is the main way you play samira reroll currently on the patch which is have samira next to samira casio next to casio and they wound the same target they shred the same targets and you basically just snowball the fight if you were to choose like units you don't double trouble you don't choose nefiri you don't choose casio and you play something like this but if you have a noxus emblem you could even find ways to be flexible and maybe go up to five in this double trouble variation you stack slain and samira but give blue buff casio a try and if you somehow find like you know all this on seven you have a really good chance of getting to fast eight and playing around really powerful units find that atrox as the top end and the rest is history in summary hit double trouble hit your three stars type gg so there you go all the comps that i think are strong and can help you climb there's a couple i didn't mention that might end up doing well like sorcerers 
or a bilge water that could situationally do well depending on certain augments but if I laid out every possibility of every comp that you can play we'd be here for hours so let me know in the comments below what you think is good maybe the patch end of developing and even more comps become viable because currently right now the meta is very wide and there's a lot of really good things that you can play even though it's kind of vanquisher and reroll central hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys in the next one